So welcome back to our um, series in 1st John. Uh, today we'll be in chapter 3 and um, if you get a chance, uh, take a chance to pray and get your heart ready for what God wants to teach us because when I was going through this chapter it was a pretty rough start. There's some strong scripture in here that uh, took me for a loop for a minute until I went through this study and, and learned uh, what it really means. So prepare your heart, give your heart a chance to uh, let God speak to you. Um, so just to start off in, in verse 1, um, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. And, and that struck me with when he calls us children how amazing it is to think about you know how we think about our children and God thinks about us that way he cares about us that much he loves us that much um, and the whole salvation thing is is one major uh, reward in the first place but then he calls us his own children he adopts us as his own and uh, it's just amazing to me and then it says uh, therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. And, you know, we shouldn't be surprised at how the world doesn't understand uh, and, and treats us in a way that uh, we find offensive. It's just because they don't understand. And, and really, it's, it's uh, probably, if we look through history, the way uh, Christians have been treated, it's uh, mostly out of jealousy and uh, partially out of fear fear of them being exposed um, because they're just ignorant of, of the truth and, um, and really if they understood God and knew him they would understand uh, you know why we act the way we do and what we do but um, part of that too is is on us um, because they don't understand we need to realize that and, and make sure we take the time to witness to them and explain things to them and once they understand it and get it in their heart then they'll have the same future as we do which is eternity with him. Um, verse 2 Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be but we shall but we know that when he is revealed we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Uh, and that's referring to <clears throat> when we do get to eternity with him in heaven. We'll be in his presence and we'll be like him as far as in the spirit. But uh, I've, some of you, I've told you all about the story, uh, the, the dream that I had about going into heaven. And um, if you haven't ever heard that story, uh, let me know and I'd love to tell you. It's, it's pretty amazing got to be in his presence and that was undescribable. Um, verse 3, and everyone who has the hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Um, and having the hope in him, knowing your destiny, you're, that you're going to spend eternity in heaven with him, um, automatically gives you uh, that strength to know that you can live a life of purity uh, because of what he's done for you and, and what your hope is in, in eternity. And that's the other thing those people that don't know him don't understand and, and don't have that that hope and that strength and uh, they're living a life of fear. Um, something uh, else we got to keep in mind when it comes to ministering to them that it's, it's a fearful thing for them because they don't understand. <clears throat> so here's the part where it kind of starts getting pretty strong in in the wording, but and, and for me, I struggled with it a lot because basically it was the way it's written. It almost sounds like it's telling you if you ever sin, you're not a Christian. But uh, stick with me here and. And we'll get through it, and I'll explain the studying that I did on it, what the scripture actually is saying. Um, and it 
it's got a lot of uh, positive hope at the end that, to get you through it. But don't let Satan distract you from what God's trying to tell you here. Um, so verse 4 says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Um, so he's starting out just calling out what it is. Sin is lawlessness and disobedience. And Jesus came specifically for, and it says he was manifested to take away our sins. Um, so we just, you know, got to call it what it is, and it is lawlessness. And uh, the first step to overcoming a problem is admitting you have a problem, um, and that is our flesh. And uh, Jesus takes away the penalty of sin uh, whenever we are saved. And he also takes away the power of sin in our lives when we are saved. And that's the, the beautiful hope we were talking about earlier that we have uh, when we are saved. Um, and this next verse, uh, verse 6, is where it really gets tough. And all that, uh, the, all the scriptures in front of this is kind of preparing us for this. But uh, it says in verse 6, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, that's some pretty strong stuff because I don't know about you, but I've sinned many times since I've become a Christian, and uh, I acknowledge that. So when I read this, it was like, okay, well, is he saying I'm, I've not been saved if I've sinned? And I started studying this and realizing that it's, the wording here is a, the the true Greek is a little different than the way it's translated, um, and the word abides is kind of like your abode; it's where you live. Um, and so, what he was, what what's being said here is that whoever lives in him, lives with him, does not sin. And uh, there's the, the misnomer here that sounds like it's saying if you ever sin, then you must not be in him. And you must not be abiding in him. But in this very same book, in 1 John chapter 1, um, he says um, in verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So it almost sounds like these two things are contradicting each other. But... As we go on, we're going to learn that what it's saying here is not that if you ever sin. What it's saying here is if you live in sin, if you continually live in sin and you don't let it convict you and you don't change that way, you don't allow God to uh, work with you and teaching you how to overcome that sin. Um, and that's what the text means. It doesn't mean that you never sin because... Like it says in First John uh, chapter 1, if you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourselves. Um, so the, the verbiage here is saying that we shouldn't settle in sin. We shouldn't continually live in sin. We should uh, not make excuses for it or say, well, everybody else does it, you know, so uh, I'm okay. Um, the, the problem with that is, is if we continue in sin and we walk in it, we're continually walking away and disconnecting ourselves from God. And that's the danger that he's warning us about. The more you do that, the more you get susceptible to uh, Satan uh, taking that hope that we were talking about earlier away from you. Um, it's a conscious decision when you decide to live in sin it's a conscious decision to walk away from God's presence um, and there's a in Romans 6 um, 
you, it says that whenever you are forgiven uh, of your sin and you go into salvation, that you should be radically changed. The old man is dead and a new man lives. Um, it's it's in, incompatible as a new creation in Christ to be comfortable in sin, in habitual sin. Um, it should only be temporary for a Christian. A Christian, you know, is going to mess up um, because we are still in our flesh, but... <clears throat> But you are convicted, you feel convicted, and you'll know that conviction if you stop praying as much, uh, if you stop going to church as much, uh, if you stop wanting to be around things that remind you of your sin and convict you. <coughs> you'll actually separate yourself from God. So <clears throat> there's the, the real danger, just like you would tell your own children, there's a danger in standing up on the table and falling off. Uh, the kid may not realize it and think you're just trying to tell him what to do. Well, that's, you know, it's the same thing. God's not just trying to tell us what to do. He's trying to warn us about the things that are uh, not good for us and that can harm us. <clears throat> so you got to question yourself about whatever sin that you might have in your life. Um, are you brushing it off? Are you saying, you know, everybody does it, I'm not, I'm not as bad as this other guy who does it more, or are you, are you allowing the conviction to teach you that that is a, a wrong action and that you should, uh, you know, go to God and, and pray about what it is and how you can overcome it <clears throat> and, and directly charge after it and try to get rid of it, um, or do you like, do like uh, Adam and Eve and and go hide, uh, separate yourself from God. Uh, it's just going backwards, you know, in your walk. Um, so, so we got to remember that the when it's talking about the sin here, it's talking about a, a lifestyle, a habitual sin, <clears throat> and that uh, you should feel the conviction. The conviction's good that teaches you uh, to the, the things that are bad for you and that you should overcome that. Um, so in uh, verse 7, it says, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Now it's moving now away from sin and start talking about righteousness <clears throat> and what righteousness is. And... Um, there's a difference between religious righteousness and our life of righteousness. Um, obviously, once you're saved, um, your sin is forgiven. You're no longer guilty. Uh, Jesus paid the price uh, from you believing uh, in Him. And there's a there's a in Romans four uh, verse three. There's a a reference to an old scripture in the Old Testament. That says. Uh, for what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So the mere uh, act of belief, and and in the word belief means from your heart, just doesn't mean oh I believe that there's a God. It means I believe God is is God in the Lord in my Lord in my life, and you know that that acceptance of of who He is is what belief is. And, uh, and that is accounted to him for righteousness. God sees that as righteousness because it's passed through the filter of Jesus. Um, so that's part of what righteousness is. And the reason why, as Christians, we can live the life of righteousness and not sin, continual sin, is because we have been given the righteousness of Christ and his spirit of righteousness we have the resource we need to live righteously. Uh, and again, those who have never found that hope, uh, and, and we wonder why they continue to do those things that we know is, is sin, <coughs> excuse me, is because they really don't have that resource that we have. I mean, we have something that Jesus has given us. So uh, to get arrogant in your righteousness is, um, 
is not a, a good thing because you should know that it's the resource is Jesus, not ourselves. Um, and you got to keep that in mind whenever you might be witness, so witnessing to someone. So in verse eight, he who sins is of the devil. Here we go again. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And there's that word manifested again. A while ago, it said he was manifested to uh, remove our sin. And here's saying he's manifested to destroy the works of the devil, which are the same thing. And he says that in the very beginning, who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. And uh, so back to walking in sin and, and part of that uh, what comes with that is you're walking in the way of Satan and you're empowering him in your life by sinning and I don't think anybody wants any part of that but um, and another thing to remember about Satan um a lot of people are unnecessarily afraid of the devil, um, fear of what he could do against you. But when you're in Christ, he's actually afraid of you. Um, there's that scripture that says, uh, resist the devil and he will flee. Um, and flee means you know, you're scared of and you run away from. If you are walking in Christ and abiding in Christ and he in you, um, Satan's actually afraid of you. And you got to remember that you have authority over him. Scripture actually says you have authority over him. And uh, But if you succumb to a sin in your life and you walk in that sin, you're, you're setting yourself up to um, him deceiving you into uh, losing that authority and uh, walking away from that authority and you know who knows what can happen from there so verse 9 whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of God and this is you know again that tough scripture that I struggled with of cannot sin does not sin but as we learn, it really means that you can't continue in sin. Um, so uh, we got to remember that when sin does come in your life and you're convicted about it, that's uh, indication that you know you need to go to God and, and go to your friends, go to people you trust that you can talk to about it. Um, there are some some real godly people in our church that uh, would be happy to sit down with anybody I know that that would uh, want to talk about their sin in their life so they can overcome it. Um, you got to um, address it just like you would, you know, like an alcoholic. They talk about an alcoholic. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Uh, we're in our flesh, and it's going to be a constant struggle, continuous struggle through all our lives. And we should be able to rely on each other and talk with each other about uh, how to overcome and, and to pray for each other to overcome. And it's what God wants and it's you know, why he's given us this scripture. <coughs> um, so in verse 10, um, it says, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. And so I thought this was kind of interesting, the way he introduces the word love in the walk of righteousness. Um, and he goes on to say just how, um, you know, like verse 11, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. <coughs> And uh, so expanding on what righteousness is, um, something that we really should uh, learn more about of how to love each other and how to go about living righteously th through love. Um, 
verse 12 says, Not as Cain, who was the wicked one, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's righteous. So he was jealous, like we were talking about earlier. He didn't understand it. He was jealous. He was fearful of being exposed. And uh, Cain's a perfect example of uh, someone who's failed to love others. And, um, and you can assume Cain had a godly upbringing because of who his parents were, but um, you know, he actually chose not to live that way. He chose not to love. Uh, and his disobedience and hatred made him miserable. And you can read about that in Genesis chapter 4, uh, verse 5. Um, Cain refused the warning of God and gave in to sin and hatred. And it's right there in that same chapter. Uh, and uh, his hatred led to actions against the one he hated. He was jealous of. And you could probably use hatred and jealousy in the same term there whenever uh, we hate. Uh, probably has a, a tinge of, of jealousy there. Um, verse 13 uh, says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Uh, we know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. <laughs> it's pretty strong stuff. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Uh, so again, we're talking about living in a life of love and righteousness. Um, and I'm sure there's many people uh, in churches all over the world and probably in our own church, that probably has somebody you don't like very much, um, somebody you mistrust for something they may have said or done, or they're just not like you, and you may feel like they're good at stuff that you're not, and you're jealous of it. But um, there's a true danger in that and living in that, and this is, again, a sin that if you allow yourself to live in and you don't, Find a way to overcome it and get past it. Um, you're endangering yourself. Um, it says right here, he who hates his brother is a murderer. <laughs> That's pretty strong words. I mean, you know, there's times where um, if you feel like you hate someone or dislike someone, it's almost like wishing they were dead. Uh, so. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a true danger. Um, and while I was reading this, I was thinking about in Luke 10, uh, verse 24, it talks about uh, the guy asking Jesus, who is my brother uh, or my neighbor? And Jesus went on to say that it's just pretty much anybody around you. So uh, whether they're in the church or not, you're still to love them and treat them uh, through love. That's part of living that righteous life. Um, verse 16 says, By this we know love. Uh, so now he's going to explain to you what love is, or how you know what love is. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. So God loved us tremendously by laying down his own life, his own son for us. And we ought to also to lay down our lives for our brethren. And uh, you know that's some pretty strong uh, commitment there. That's, that's way beyond just disliking someone because you don't like the way they act. Um, you should be laying down your life for these people. Um, some really tough stuff because I, I can't think of anybody that I know that's ever laid down their lives for others. Um, some, some powerful stuff. So, simply put, John is telling us to do the same thing. And we could read this in Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. It says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, 
but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And uh, one of the things that struck me when I read this is, you know, the world tells us to love ourselves first. And scripture says it a little bit differently. It says put others first. Um, not that you should not care for yourself and, and take care of yourself, but it really puts others in, in a higher level there. Of I mean, We really should be thinking of others first. Uh, it's a hard thing to do, but um, especially those that we don't really care for that much. But uh, we should be looking out for each other and putting each other first. And you know, it says, lowliness in mind, esteem others better than himself. So uh, verse 17 says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So you know, we're really good at talking about how we love each other and take care of each other and do things for each other, but... Really, it, uh, it's not, the way Scripture is talking here is, that's not the whole, the whole thing is, you know, it's one thing to say that you love each other, but it's another thing to do something and to, uh, like it says, but in deed and in truth. And it also, when I was reading this, it reminded me of uh, the definition of love. If you want to look in more into, uh, deeper into love, um, there's, it's in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13. Uh, it explains you know, what love really is. And in verse 19, And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. When our heart condemns us from, from committing sin, um, you know, it, it says God's, uh, God is greater than what's in our heart. So we've got to understand that um, when we do sin and we feel condemned, uh, the last thing you want to do is go to God who you sinned against, but um, He's helping us to know here that He's willing and ready to help us overcome those sins that instead of hiding from it and hiding from him that we should confront it and go to him so he can help us uh, overcome it and get that out of our lives uh, it's important that we don't uh, ignore it and push it down we got to bring it up and it helps a lot to talk to others about it as well um, but uh, also it comes it says uh, in, in verse 21 about if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And that speaks to whenever you do overcome sin and you're walking in, in righteousness and, and abiding in Him and He's abiding in you, uh, you gain confidence in your walk. And in, uh, in other verses it talks about boldness to, to witness in His name. We have that confidence to, to pray for him about what we need in our walk and, and to, uh, to be uh, more uh, stronger in, in witnessing to others and building the kingdom in his name and his glory. Um, so what he wants to do is help us overcome that sin and gain in confidence in our walk and be more effective uh, for him. Um, in verse 22, it says, uh, and it's speaking to this confidence, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And um, that first little part of the sentence there really strikes me as really powerful words of he's telling you whatever you ask, you receive from him. When, you, when you're living in that confidence and living in righteousness, um, there's even one scripture that says, uh, if you command the mountains to move into the sea, 
it will be done. And uh, you know, really, some some really powerful words there that he uses to let you know that uh, that when you're walking in in righteousness and truth and loving of others and overcoming sin. Your confidence in in your walk and your connection to Him, your relationship to Him, your closeness to Him, gets stronger and stronger, and you uh, you can pray for whatever you ask, and you will receive from Him. Um, so, you know it it's a, it's a life that builds uh, as you as you overcome sin that you were before the old man, and you become the new man, and you're overcoming sin, and your, your righteousness walk gets stronger and stronger, um, that, that living in confidence is, uh, is a powerful thing uh, to feel. Uh, some of you know that. Um, but there is a caveat when, this, when you talk, he talks about, anytime he talks about whatever you ask, you will receive from him. Um, in John chapter 15, verse 7, it talks about, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. So, um, you know, that that answer to prayer comes from you listening and believing and walking in his righteousness and abiding in him, and he abides in you. And we talked about that before, about the word is abode, where you live living in righteousness, uh, that confidence comes. Um, in verse 23 it says, And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. We're talking about Jesus and you. And by this we know that he abides in us. And here he comes. By the Spirit whom He has given us. And for those of you who have experienced salvation, know full well that His Spirit is in you and you feel that Spirit moving in you whenever you go through life. Um, <coughs> uh, so know that if you're not feeling that Spirit moving you, um, there may be some things that uh, that's in your life that you haven't, put aside and given up and it's keeping you from a stronger walk in him um, and uh, you know Jesus spoke uh, of the greatest commandment that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul with all your mind and he added that uh, the second is like it you shall love your neighbor as yourself so um, the beginning is uh, believing in God believing in Jesus, becoming saved, but then you got to walk in his commandment, which he says is like that, and it says loving your neighbor as yourself. It's a very big uh, commandment that, you know, over, uh, just uh, supersedes just about all the other commandments, that, that if you live in this commandment, then you will live out the other commandments. <clears throat> so, in conclusion... Um, we walk in love and he abides in us it's very simple uh, it started out strong saying that if you ever sin you're not of him but we've learned through this chapter that um, what that means is, is living a life of sin and, and continuing in sin uh, we should uh, desire to, to know better than that and to overcome the things that are keeping us from uh, a confident life, a confident walk in Him. So, um, I thank y'all for, for listening in, and I hope that while you are at home, you're taking advantage of that time to study and get closer to God, and uh, also praying for others, and uh, loving each other, um, and I hope you have a blessed day. <laughs>